Yeshivat Mekor Chayim, we teach, we teach Rav Kook, we teach Rabbi Nachman. Rav Kook told us that as a nation, eight Tzaragi Yaakov Imem Yibashaya, that we should not be uh, depressed or uh, upset when we have problems with developing as a nation, because every challenge makes us grow and makes us grow, get stronger. Rabbi Nachman says something similar about us as individuals. Bad stuff that happens to us is the gift wrapping of good things. We can never understand how this is, and you know what? We don't understand how this works, and it's beyond human understanding. But somehow, whenever we have a crisis, there are those people who know how to pick themselves up and take that crisis and use it to share with others how they pick themselves up and they believe in Hashem and they go forward with their lives. And one of those very special people is Racheli Frankel. Welcome, Racheli Frankel. Bakasha. Thank you. I really want to talk to you, so and I don't know what's interesting to you. So we're gonna do. I'll, we'll have a two-minute video just to remind you of the, you know, the pictures we were. Uh, whatever I'm jet lagged. Uh, the experience we had last summer, and um, and then it's all gonna be question dialogue based. Um, you know, I don't know what's interesting to you, so you choose what to ask. And and then we have another short video in the in the end, just to um, I'll tell you about it later. So. My 16-year-old son Naftali sends us a text and he says he's on his way home. Next thing we know, we're in the middle of the most surreal situation. The three Israeli teens disappeared. Abducted, quote, by a terrorist organization. The Israeli army staged huge security sweeps looking for the missing teenagers. The country has really been riveted on this story. People gather to call for the safe release of three teenage boys. We just want them back in our home, in their beds. We just want to hug them again. Authorities believe those boys are now dead. The bodies of three missing Israeli teens have been found. Israel is mourning as funerals were held for the three teens. The grief and outrage over these murders tonight in Israel is extraordinary. Those 18 days, they were filled with the darkest hours, but also amazing hours. We discovered our family, our friends, our community, our country, our people. People all over the world had thousands of grassroots initiatives. I spoke to people in Cape Town, in Kathmandu, in Australia. There were delegations from all over North America, Europe. People all over were saying, these are not just your boys, these are our children. Sometimes I ask myself, was this just an illusion? And I have this image of a person walking in the dark, and it's raining, and they're stumbling, and they're figuring out their way, don't see anything. And then for a second there's lightning. And in that lightning, they see the reality of their surroundings. It helps them guide their way. We had days and days of lightning. It's no illusion. What we saw about ourselves, we're part of something huge. We're part of a people, of a true family. That's for real. Somebody called our home and said, you know, I'm considered a non-affiliated Jew. I want to tell you, I feel so affiliated. Cain asks, am I my brother's keeper? I think our answer came out loud and clear. We are one family, and I am my brother's keeper. It's no illusion. Even if day-to-day -day life doesn't feel like this, what we saw was real. Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Let's all choose an act, large or small, to keep the spirit of those days alive. It was said, we went out searching for the boys and we discovered ourselves. I have this way of not looking at the film every time. <laughs> Some of the sites are hard. Um, I'll, I'll just use this opportunity. Um, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I know for many, 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 many of you were with us every second of this ordeal, and 
of the search and the prayers and you know writing to uh, politicians and trying to get people to do things and rallying and it was an amazing rally uh, here in Washington. There was another amazing rally in New York that was joined to bring bring our girls bring back our girls of the, the Nigerians. Um, and I, I know you and your families, your hearts were open, and there were magnets and, and, and ribbons and, and the names and the sidurim. I just want to thank you for that. It, it literally meant the world to us. And I know in any given room, there's people that suffered uh, pain and loss, and your young people, so I hope it's not very close in your circle, but we've all known some of it. And uh, in our story, I, I, I don't know how to imagine it otherwise, because people were so good to us. And Jews from all over the world reached out and connected and, and created something special out of this. So I just, Mamash, in the simplest way, want to say toda. And just a, a simple toda, really, from the bottom of our, of our heart. Um, and now let's talk about what's interesting to you. I, no, no question is too personal because I've learned how to duck questions. I don't. Want to. So go ahead. Yeah, go. Um, do you have any other children, and if so, how did they react to this whole ordeal? Uh, thank God, Naftali is the second of seven. Oh wow. And uh, it it was you know my youngest is five. My oldest his birthday is today, and he just turned twenty. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's different for each one of them uh, because they're in a different uh, stage in life and because their relationship to Nuftali was different. We ha I, I remember them uh, Friday morning. Um, we sent them to school without telling them that something's going on and because we wanted to figure out and deal with it. And, uh, and at some point I realized that there were WhatsApps that going around that people know. So I went to my girls' school to um, to uh, you know find them and speak to them before anybody else gets to them, and they were in the middle of a celebration. So I went there, and I uh, they didn't want to leave. So I was just standing there, making sure nobody approaches them. And now I think it was totally surreal because there were other parents there, and the other parents already knew, and they didn't understand what I'm doing there in the middle of this place. So I was just waiting for them, and. And then I had to take them out and, you know, explain to each in their own language. So like my six-year-old, I told her, you know, um, she, she was from, she was in kindergarten at the time. And I said, you know, uh, Naftali got lost and everybody is looking for him. And she started crying and she said, we're not going to find him just like we didn't find our dog. And we had a dog that, you know, we did everything there. To so, so I realized that you have to speak in a language that they, that they understand. Probably the worst thing I, you know, I ever did, my worst experience was uh, when the final news came, was taking each one of them individually and breaking the news to them. And you, you feel like you're taking this gorgeous flower and you, you know you're going to crush it. And we were telling them, so you're going to see Abarima cry because we're sad. But you can rely on us, we're not falling apart on you. And God willing, we'll, we'll be a happy family again. It's not, you know, the world is not ending now. And in, in general, that's, that's thank God. Um, there's there's a, a, a vacant space in our family, but there's a lot of, uh, there are no museums. You know, we wear his clothing, we sleep in his bed, we, whatever, he doesn't have so much stuff. But uh, it, it, we're, not, we're not walking, tiptoeing around his existence. He's part of the family. Whenever the kids, you know, name the children in the family, they always name him. Um, it, it's about, you know, the, one of the first Shabbatot, uh, we were singing Zmirot Shabbat. Every parent has their time that's extremely difficult. Uh, uh, Gilad's father, Ophir, describes the Kat Kohanim. In America, it's only a few times a year. Uh, in Israel, it's all the time. So in Berkat Kohanim and Shabbat, it's customary to have your children under your talit. And, and feeling that Void for him is always heartbreaking, and for us it's Zmirot Shabbat because Naftali was very, very musical, and he played the guitar and he sang in choirs, and and Zmirot is always a hard time. And one of the first Shabbatot, uh, my ten-year-old Noga, she she I saw something was going on. She was running ran, running to the couch, and she turned to me with <coughs> in her eyes she had a question: Am I allowed to cry? 
And they went over to her and they said, you know, Noga, it's the Seder Gamur, it's fine to cry, and you know what? It's fine to be happy too. And I feel like many of us, we need permission. Um, as if, over the last few months, I, I met uh, many families that suffered loss. They, they usually approach you and they, um, they want to tell you that there's life afterwards. I remember in the Shiva, uh, you know, uh, family after family, they come over and, and it accumulates and you say, whoa, what people go through in, these, in this life. And, um, and there are different styles of, de of dealing with it. And you can't, it, it. I'm not judgmental at all. Everybody deals with whatever in their own way. And I've seen families where you're not allowed to cry because we're strong. And I've seen families where you're not allowed to laugh because we suffered such a loss. And, and then there are the families that come over to you and they say, we put a smile on our face for our children, for our grandchildren, because uh, life goes on. And, but you and I know it's all a mask. And the truth is I give them a lot of credit for wearing a mask because it, it, you know, they go to work, they keep a family. But lo matim, uh, masks don't suit me. <laughs> so I try to give, give room for laughter and give room for crying and, you know, experience the whole arena, whatever is in the middle. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to let my children know. I, 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 I hope that's, there are times like this and times like that, but I, I hope that's what they're getting. Um, so... We're modern, just in, in the, uh, finally answering your question, when, question, we're monitoring them. We're seeing that, you know, nobody has any major dips, but I'm sure the little each will have to take it to their own, whatever it, um, whatever. <laughs> that was that. Yeah, you want to that? Yeah. How did you have the courage to speak out? Um... I'm trying to think if, if there was any courage involved. I think we we acted very into it, you know, upon our intuitions. Um, within 48 hours, we realized that the world is, you know, everybody's going upside down. Everybody's doing crazy things to try to find them. Uh, the army and the and the intelligence and the government and Jews all over the world and everybody's so involved and we felt a real need to to thank people. So contrary to the advice of the IDF team that was living in our house, um, we said we must speak out. And they said, no, 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 keep it. let your brother-in-law do that. Uh, you should be protected. And we said, no, no, we have to thank people. So that was the first time we spoke out. And later, we were just focused on trying to do whatever could uh, maybe help find the boys. Um, the idea to go to Geneva to speak in the Human Rights Council came from 11th graders that happened to have been in uh, like a mock UN experience and they, they met Hilen Noya, that's the head of uh, UN Watch, and he explained to them how it works. They have slots for speakers and these 11th graders said, so why don't you bring the parents? And he said, oh, that's a wonderful idea, but it's the last day of, uh, of, that we're convened, but next time it's only in September. Within hours, <laughs> and really I thought it's a joke, but within hours I was on the plane to Switzerland. <laughs> And Iris never had a, a passport in her life. And it was arranged in 30 minutes. And so we were just there, you know, you get 120 seconds, you speak. People say that it was a very hostile environment. We didn't feel it because we did, we did our spiel and we, we then spoke to journalists. So it wasn't about courage. It was about just speaking out where we felt we, we can do some good. Um, later on, there was a horrifying murder in Yerushalayim of a 16-year-old Arab boy. So we felt we, we can't be silent about that. So whenever we spoke, and, and at some point there was a war and we were kind of part of the Israeli Asbara, so we spoke to, to foreign press. But it, I, I don't think it, take, it takes courage. It was just, you know, we were very focused in what, what we're trying to reach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're being so polite to each other. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Yeah. How did you feel about all the attention, like everyone focusing on your family? Basically, um, we, we felt, we, we, really, we didn't even feel, we knew that it all comes from such a place of connection and involvement and caring that it didn't become an issue. We were just like, you know, 
I don't, I don't, I don't even need to share this experience with you because you, you made this experience your own. Um, when, you, when you feel family and you experience something, it, it, you're defining the experience. And Am Yisrael was unbelievable in that way. And they reached out and they became part and they, and just by them bringing themselves into this position of, of caring and of being involved, I didn't feel I was, you know, the, the hyper focus because it was like we're all in this together. Um, the truth is, that, I'll put it bluntly, in, in a world where thousands of people are murdered every day, every day, and nobody even winks, it's like a miracle that three kids didn't come home from school and Jews, all, millions of people all over the world are losing sleep over it. It's like, it, it should never be taken for granted. I think it speaks volumes about who we are. So, so I can deal with some attention, <laughs> you know, it's not like, uh, yeah. What was your son like? So, <laughs> thanks for the question. <laughs> um, <coughs> there was a time I'd walk in Israel and uh, somebody would stop their car and roll down the window and say, Geveret, abanim shelachem tzadikim. Uh, people were saying that the tunnels, the terror attack tunnels were, were found somehow through them. And, and that, you know, it, it was all attributed to who they are. And I, I would say in my heart, Matza a 16-year-old kid, you know. Is a, so Naftali is a, a, a high school student in Yeshivat Mekokhay, which is a very unique place where there's, you learn profoundly deep Torah, but in an environment of being uh, your own person and being free and being in charge of your, your, your spiritual growth and, and altogether growth. And it was a very joyful place for him. He loved music. Uh, he loved the friends. Um, he, in Bnei Akiva, they have this thing where they approach you and they say, will you give us a gift, a trait of his uh, personality that we can live on? And it was very embarrassing to, to me to hear that. And like, I, I didn't know what to say about him. And over time, I, I had accumulated um, many stories where the common motive was that when he would come into a situation and he would be, you know, the old timer, the one that feels comfortable, he'd always recognize the newcomers and the people that are insecure and bring them in, but not in a patronizing way, but, you know, like playing a mean frisbee game or, you know, just bringing them in, forcing them in. And, and so I said, okay, take that as a gift, <laughs> you know. There's always someone there that's weaker than you and feeling insecure, and if you can just pay attention and not patronize, just pull them in. Um, somehow we, uh, things live nice, like in harmony with him. Um, when he was uh, in elementary school, he learned in a Talmud Torah, where they recited all day, it was very wonderful. And it, when I thought he's being held uh, capture, I said, "Oh, at least he knows so many things by heart. He must be, you know, having, you know, uh, trying to recite, giving, so he doesn't go insane." And um, and then one day a week he would go to these this special program with for whatever gifted children, and and there he would be with girls, with secular people, with Arabs, and and everything was fine. It all fit together. <laughs> Uh, for the last year, he, he created this MP3 player that had every style of music he could put his hands on. Uh, classical and rock and Hasidic and, and Israeli and, and all the and like all the oldies that I liked. I would I would and his sisters would say, "This is what you're listening to," and he said, "No, you have to hear every song three times so you get the you understand it." And so so things lived nicely with him. Um, there was a, a time. We're supposed to be snowed in for two days, and um, uh, that night I, I, I let myself, because I knew I'm not going to work the next day, I let myself read things that I was pushing away, like uh, letters from very close friends of his. I know it, it takes time, you know, it will take me a day to, to pick myself up. So I read and I wept and I read and I wept, and then I went over to his drawer. I know these the Hulim Dosim in Israel, the, the religious guys, they hardly own anything, you know, a t shirt, a pair of pants, and every it was the last day of school and everything he had from the dorm was all in one big pack that was with his trillion and everything that was burnt on the way, you know, by, by the terrorists. So I have hardly had any physical evidence of him. So I opened his drawer 
and there was an envelope there um, that I, I was looking at it, it had a lot of money in it. And I turned it over and it said, Maaser Ksafim Sheli, my master at Tzedakah money from the summer job or whatever. So I started crying. <laughs> and then a friend uh, called. And he said, did you know what just how I described what just happened? And he said, oh, you had that coming because you said he's not a tzaddik. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, so that's not enough to me. It's like a normal 16-year-old, fights with his sisters. And I must say, Eyal uh, was 18. He was two years older. And he was a true giver. He was, everywhere he was, he was you know, looking for, for things to give. And they had a miracle happen to them. When Eyal went home for Shabbat, he left his personal journal he's been writing for a year, like with all his inner thoughts, he left it on the standard of yeshiva. Nobody does such a thing. And now they have a legacy from Eyal, envious, and, and he's, he writes the most amazing things. And Gilad was full of life, like he's celebrating life all the time. Um, young, you know, when, when you speak about such young people, it's mostly, you mostly find yourself speaking about potential and missed potential. I don't know. So in, in a way, it's weird that my 16-year-old kid had such tremendous effects on so many people around the world. Um, so we never know. I don't know. In the eyes of it, it I, I tell myself, in the eyes of eternity, what's the difference between 16 years and 60 years? Of course, emotionally, it's different <laughs> for me. Ken? Um, did you ever feel as if God deserted you? No. <laughs> um, you know, when people said that they heard us speaking emunah, I was very surprised because I thought I didn't say a single word about emunah. As a mother and a teacher, I, I made a mental note of it, that it's not what you say that counts. Um, I know that people, there's this concept, it's a mostly an emotional concept, that people feel when you go through hardship, it somehow comes between you and God. Um, and I understand it, but it doesn't, it, it seems irrational to me. Because, um, because Ashbachu doesn't owe me anything. And you know, nobody promised me a rose garden. And we kind of live in, I'll pretend for a second, like we're in the same generation. We're, we live in a day and age where we feel that with enough technology and medicine and who knows, we're all going to live happily ever after. But the truth is, um, you know, before bad things happened to other people and now a bad thing happened to me. Um, so, so how does that change anything? Um, being in a place of uh, feeling um, vulnerable and fragile is... Uh, it's a lesson in humility that, for me, is a lesson in emunah. It gives proportions to my life. When, when what you want more than anything else is totally out of your control. And I, I guess it made prayer more real. And it stayed like, that way, even when things um, didn't work out the way I wanted them to work. Uh, and also, in the Levaya, there were, there were Three parts in the in the in the funeral. One was like when all of Am Yisrael. It was unbelievable. There were way over 100,000 people in, in that funeral, and um, and before that we came from three communities. And before that we had a few minutes alone with Nafili in the room. And I had this. Uh, I was thinking how tall he was, and he didn't finish growing yet. And I had this sense of this is my son's body. It's not my son. So. You know, we speak about the you know, soul and body, whatever, but this was so much in my face that it, in a way it gives a new perspective on spirituality to me. Uh, you were asking before about uh, my kids. So when, when during those days we were, we were saying Kriyachma and we were praying for them, whatever, but before, we had very tiny, little time to be just alone with the kids, but we made sure we put them to sleep and we prayed for the boys. And then I would all, always end with Vashem Hayashar Benav Yaseh. And you know, it's, it's out of our control. Um, it's interesting if we're mentioning here Kriyat Shema, the kids, um, they started saying, <laughs> about maybe seven, eight months ago, they started saying, uh, they always said, Vashem Hashem Elokei Israel, Mimini Michael, Nismolek Yavriel, Mifanai, Uriel, Machoai, Rafael. And then they started saying, Naftali Mistakel, Uman Roshi Shchinat Er. 
And, and then one of the, the youngest ones said, he was four at the time, he said, but yesterday we said Naftali. So Noga said, but we say that we repeat this three times. So ever since when they go to sleep, they have one for Eyal, one for Gilad, and one for Naftali. And at, at first I thought it's just a cute story. But then I realized there's like there's a wisdom to it. They, they they put their brother up there with the you know guarding angels and and they, they can, as far as I can see, they can keep on saying it till they're eight years old. You know, it's lot of and and it's part of their world. Um, so, yeah, that's the whole story. <laughs> yes. Um, sort of similar. Has your relationship with God changed because of this? Um. Naturally, I mean, I, I think I, 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 prayer became more more real to me, and it's interesting because um, I never related to prayer as uh, some kind of MTA machine, like like you put in TV one one side and get results that the other side. Uh, it, it was never a functional thing, um, and and you know it proved here that it, that it isn't. I had this. There was this story where we, we were coming back from Paris. He was going to say goodbye to Obama, and we stopped on the way to uh, in the hotel, and there was a bunch of kids running, and they were saying, "Oh, we're saying Tehillim, and we're giving to the and everything's going to be okay." And I, I get this anxiety that I was feeling for a few days, besides being anxious for my son, that what would happen, what what will happen if things go wrong? And I, I had no idea someone was filming it, but I, I said something to the effect of Hashem doesn't work by us, you know, like if, if things don't work out for the best, you should stay together, whatever it was. And somehow that became viral. And in the beginning I was very embarrassed, but then I realized it was a discussion that was very important for us to have. We've had it before, but usually after the deed, when it becomes apologetic. Uh, why didn't we get what we wanted, Nachshon Vaxman, whatever. And, and here it was in the midst of everything, and at least in Israel, it was very significant to speak about prayer and what we think about prayer. And, um, you know, for people that pray, that, and for people that watch other people pray, that think that, that uh, you know, what are they trying to achieve? And, and Dafka, out of that experience, where I, I never, you know, I never thought it's a function, functional, you know, I, I want to get something, that's why I'm praying. And even more so, to me now, prayer is real in the sense where it's a relationship. It's a, it doesn't mean I, I, you know, if I pray for a parking place, I'll get my parking place. <laughs> but um, it, it, it makes me stand in a relationship, relationship before God. Um, the <laughs> a few days after the ship, I got a phone call from this young lady that I... I don't know how she got my number, right? She said, I'm very angry with Hashem about what happened, and somebody told me I should call you. I said, really? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I told her what I guess many of, the, of you would have said, that being angry is also a form of a relationship. You know, it's... And... Um, for me, anger is a waste of energy. I, I, I had a life to rebuild and, and children to take care of and, and a job to go back to. And all these dark places have such an immediate effect on me that, that drains all my energy. So I don't want my, to waste my energy being angry. But uh, for her, if she feels angry, it's a form of a relationship. So, so be angry. So say you're angry. It, 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 for me, it's significant to say that um, People, for some people, emuna is like a is like a cornerstone in their in their life. It's always stable. It's always there. And for other people, like myself, it's always been dynamic. And um, sometimes you feel very close. Sometimes you feel feel very distant. Or you, you know, um, I, I remember times where I'd walk out to a starry sky and I'd say, "Really? Oops, I shouldn't be saying that, right?" But. It, it, that's what it is. It's a relationship, and um, whatever. And it, it doesn't matter if you learn in Beis Yaakov in the Hebrew Academy or in a, in a you know secular school in Israel. It's it's so. Yeah. If there was one last thing you could have said, then what would you have said? Ooh, wow. <laughs> Challenging question. Um, 
You know how Americans finish every conversation with love you? <laughs> I started doing it now. <laughs> but we were very mushy. Uh, um, he's, uh, he's a teenager and I always gave him a space and I, I didn't, you know, dig, in, dig into his inner... Uh, and and um, I hope he knew how much he meant to us. And um, <sighs> I, I, it's, it's, it's a hard question. Um, somebody, I, I was once in some setting, somebody said to me, did it change your parenthood? And she said, I'm asking you because this story changed my mother's parenthood. And I said, you know, I... If it's as far as being more anxious, no, it didn't change me. I, I'm not more anxious, so, you know, I, I, but if it's as far as, you know, using more opportunities to have conversations, to connect, I wish that it's something about who we are and who our children are and wanting to give them space that you can't always live under this feeling that maybe I won't see you tomorrow. So, but I'll, I'll take that question home with me. I'll see if, uh, if there's something I can, I can always write him. <laughs> Iris Ayal's mother sends him the water. <laughs> she has an ongoing conversation with him. Yes? Did you know the families of Ayal and Gilad before? I didn't know them. Um, Gilad uh, and, and Nathalie sat in this, they actually sat together in class and together in the Beth Midrash on the same bench. They weren't the best friends, but they were just, you know, friends. And Eyal was two years older than them, and he just met them in the, in the bus station. And I got to know them four days into the kidnapping. The truth is there was so many chasadim, so much grace around this tragedy. One of it was that we, we went through this experience, and you're under the impression that anything you do might change the fate, the, the fate of, your, of your children, and it's very important that you can rely on, the, on your partners. So these were, you know, the six of us, it, it, it was great because we, we, get, we understood each other, we, we trusted each other, and we're still, we have, we're very close. Um, we have our own lots of proof. <laughs> um, uh, our children are the same ages, we're going through similar things. Our, our thoughts about commemoration and, and doing things to, to keep up, well, unity sounds like such a cliche, right? But, there was a special sense of achdut and coming together and, uh, and being there for each other and we would love to, to hold on to some of that spirit. Um, and so, so, so I didn't know them ahead of time, but I'm close to them now. Yes? Um, when Naftali was kidnapped, did you ever think he would come back so it started like 3.30, we were woken up by, by policemen, and I, for a second there, it's just, I thought it's about what, going upstairs and finding him in bed. But then when I rang his phone and he didn't answer, and he wasn't home, I, I thought we were in deep trouble, and I was thinking about traffic accidents or whatever. Um, and uh, ever since, everybody was very, very honest with us the Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense and the Head of the Army and the Head of the Intelligence. We knew there were shots uh, in the car and they said, listen, it might just be to scare them, it might be um, they wanted one hostage and not three, and maybe they're all dead and maybe they're wounded. We're working under the work assumption that they're alive and we're going to find them alive. And honestly, I think if they wouldn't have been working under that assumption, I don't know if they would have ever been found or maybe years from now. I waited for my son for 18 days. The mother of Rachel Sespotas waited for her son for 81 days, which seems crazy to me. And the mother of Ilan Saadon waited for him for seven years. So I, I, I don't know how I can raise a happy, healthy family if this would have gone on forever. But I was willing to wait for as long as it takes rather than have bad news. The, um, so all along we knew that, that everything's open, all the options are open. And there was good reason to think they are alive because there were clear intelligence, and also now we have one of the one of the compass, uh, whatever you call them, the terrorists, um, uh, saying that he was waiting for a sign to come and feed them, and for the first night the sign wasn't up because th they made their rounds and they didn't find the proper victims, 
And the second night, uh, he was waiting for a sign, and the sign wasn't up. And then later, they came to him and they said, help us bury them. We killed them. And when, they, when he asked if we were talking about hostages, he said, well, they, they resisted, and that's why we killed them, which I don't know if, if it's true or not. Um, so the, the basic idea for sure was hostages to keep them alive and to some kind of, some, somehow negotiate. And yeah, I mean, I, I thought it might take a long time if we go into a negotiation situation. You know, it actually took five years, and we weren't thinking about five years, but I thought it might take months. Um, I knew there's a chance that they're dead somewhere, but I was, I, I had reason to be optimistic, not naive optimistic. You know, even if you have 15% of seeing your, your, your son alive, that's a huge 15%. Um, that's, uh, I, 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 it's, it's important to me to say that everybody was honest with us all the time. We weren't misled or fooled to think something other than the reality. Uh, you'll give us a three minute warning so we can uh, show them. Okay? It's already three minutes? Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you, so I'm going to show you um, a video. Um, Gilad and Afkali's classmates are 11th graders, and being that it's a special school and everybody, you know, wears their heart out. Uh, the vacation was very difficult because they were separated and when they came back together, one of their friends said, the pieces of Naftali and Gilad that each one of us carries out in our heart, we just came together and Gilad and Naftali were with us for the rest of the year. Um, so as a therapeutic thing, they, they uh, contacted a few singers in Israel of different kinds, you know, Hasidic and secular, and, and with the kids and with the families, they created this song uh, in memory of the boys. Tachlitcha berachamim al banecha Kulam ledoot yishama Bashamayim mitzavim la'al barecha Uvarez amselanu nechama Oh, 
בטירוף בין מרדף לנרדף תעלה זעקה לשלום הנכסף והעם שעייף משנאת החינם התאחד בחיבוק אחי Oh, oh, oh. 